Good morning, everyone. So this is the final session of the summer school. Uh, and uh, we are on time. We are always starting like with half an hour delay. So it's good that we start on time at 10.30. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, for today's session, uh, I will just introduce uh, our moderator today and then uh, she will be uh, presenting the uh, speakers we have for uh, the session. Zeynep Kadir Beyoğlu is a very good friend and colleague of mine. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Boğaziçi University. And uh, she holds a PhD in political science from McGill University in Canada. And uh, her PhD dissertation was on decentralization and democratization with a case study of irrigation management uh, transfer in Turkey. And her research interests include globalization, transnational networks, democratization, decentralization, citizenship, environmental change, and forced migration. So thanks for being with us, Zeynep. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So um, uh, first, we'll have the uh, the speakers, and then we'll have a discussion session, as uh, as always. Um, so first, we will have Derek Wall, um, uh, who uh, is international coordinator of the Green Party of England and Wales. Uh, his PhD, The Politics and Philosophy of Earth First UK, is from the University of West England, and his new book, Economics After Capitalism, will be published in well, has already been published, 2015. Okay, okay. Because I was thinking, will be published? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it will be published very soon. <laughs> um, uh, his previous 10 books include The Sustainable Economics of Elnor Ostrom and The Rise of the Green Left. He teaches new radical political economy at Goldsmiths College, University of London, and he's a founder of the Eco Socialist International Network and writes for the Morning Star newspaper. Um, so I will also introduce Pat Devine now, who will be talking and commenting on Derek's talk and giving his own comments after the, um, the talk. Uh, so Pat Devine is an honorary research fellow in the School of Social Science at the University of Manchester. He's a Marxist political economist influenced by Antonio Gramsci uh, and Karl Polanyi, uh, who works on the political economy of Britain since 1945, ecological economics and socialist participatory planning. He's the convener of the UK-based Red Green Study the group whose work draws upon the best of the socialist and green traditions and you had actually reading material um, from that uh, group um, and um, uh, so this group seeks to develop a coherent vision of a future eco-socialist society. Um, Pat is the author, joint author and uh, joint editor of an introduction to industrial economics, economic plan and planning and democracy, what on earth is to be done and economy uh, and society and Feel Bad Britain, and numerous other articles. Um, and he enjoys hill walking and climbing. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll start with Derek, and then we'll continue with Pat. Is, is that OK with the mic? Or do I need to hold it nearer? A little nearer. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, what I'm going to talk about is eco-socialism and institutions. So, of course, I'm going to talk about Eleanor Ostrom. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, some of you may have come across, died in 2012, and is known as the only woman so far to win a Nobel Prize for economics. And, OK, strictly speaking, it isn't the Nobel Prize, it's the Swedish Bank Prize, but it's a kind of shocking indictment of economics that she's the only woman ever to win that. Um, when I wrote my book, The um, Sustainable Economics of Eleanor Ostrom, um, I dedicated it, of course, to my wife, um, Emily Blythe, and I also de dedicated it to all the comrades, but particularly the comrades in Mindanao. And I, I don't know whether everybody knows this reference, but when we, we look at eco-socialism, I'm going to talk briefly about eco-socialism, what you have is um, groups who've been in conflict, who hold territory, who around the world are instigating eco-socialism. Um, one of the most impressive examples of this, but maybe obscure to people, is on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. 
you have the Revolutionary Workers' Party, and they became eco-socialists, joined the Fourth International, have a territory like the Chiapas, and their kind of forms of self-government, I think, are at the heart of what Ostrom was talking about. Now, when we talk about an Ostrom, people come up to me and say, Ostrom, we're doing a project about the commons. She was the prophet of the commons. And I would actually say that her work um, extends far beyond the commons and has got a lot to kind of inform us about eco-socialism and, and green politics and political ecology beyond the commons. And two things I was going to emphasise, which I think are very important for understanding Ostrom's work. One is what's happening in Rojava. Um, I think that's absolutely key, and that fits in absolutely with her ideas and her, the ideas of her husband Vince and the whole network. So again, when you talk about Ostrom, people think of Eleanor Ostrom, but there's a whole network of scholars. And the other word I was going to emphasise was pragmatism. And whenever I talk about Ostrom, I'm always you know, kind of scared that it will be difficult to communicate what's going on, because I think what she was doing was so heterodox, doesn't come from a lot of the usual reference points, that I think it's very, very easy to kind of misread what she was doing. So a kind of key word for reading what she was doing was pragmatism. What I'm going to attempt to do is three things. I'm going to talk about how I think Ostrom's um, work can inform eco-socialism, but I would stress she wasn't an eco-socialist, she wasn't a Marxist, she wasn't somebody who defined herself as on the left, but I think that, that's useful to do. I'm going to look at some of the problems and critiques of her work, and I'm then going to attempt to say, where do we go forward from that? So if we look at eco-socialism, um, you know, briefly I think we're probably familiar with the idea of some kind of merger between red politics and green politics. Um, we may be familiar with, um, you know, back in the 1980s, people like Rudolf Barrow and Andre Gores and so on. Um, you know, I think there are maybe two kind of evolutions to eco-socialism, to maybe oversimplify it. One is that you had people on the left in the 20th century, and the left in the 20th century wasn't particularly ecological. As we've seen, there's been multiple crises of the left, so what you would have is a kind of trajectory, like a typical example would be Anne and Lippiette in the French Greens, who go from being Maoists and regulation theorists and so on, to members of the Green Party. And again, you might think of the German Greens, where you have people who have come out of the student left in the 70s and moved to the right. So it may be that eco-socialism is just a staging post on a move from one kind of politics to a non-left politics. Um, certainly in the UK, the, the crisis of the Communist Party was one of the things that kind of led to eco-socialism and eco-socialist groups and so on and so forth. So it can be kind of seen as a retreat from kind of class-based left politics. Um, another way of coming of it is, is people like me who start off in the Ecology Party, which was the name of the Green Party that we have in the UK, that we're not a UK-based party, we're very much kind of Republican, decentralist, the so Scottish Green Party is already a separate nation. And when I, I joined the then Ecology Party in 1980, when I was a teenager, the discourse was kind of very Malthusian. So it's very much limits to growth, concerns with population, um, overconsumption, and then that was my kind of political background and my kind of political education. And then I kind of started thinking, as I think many of us do, that maybe from that background, why is there growth? What is the demand for growth? And then, of course, you know, grow, the, this kind of route to eco-socialism, of course, is to say growth is functional to capitalism. So I kind of read Andre Gore's Ecology is Politics, which is interesting because that's somebody moving away from a kind of class-based Marxist politics. And, of course, he said, um, you know, farewell to the working class. And then for other people, that's a kind of entry into a Marxist politics. And what you've had is a range of literatures talking about um, capitalism and ecology. And one book you may be familiar with is Joel Colville's book, The Enemy of Nature. And Colville argues in that that the efficient cause of ecological destruction um, is growth, and that growth comes from capitalism. So you need some kind of Marxist analysis to understand growth, and then what you need to move to 
is a communist society, a post-capitalist society. But Colville was sceptical to the extent that eco-socialism was something which is inherent in Marx and Engels. And then, of course, what we have, which is a great revelation, is John Bellamy Foster's book, Marx's Ecology. And in Marx's Ecology, um, Bellamy Foster says that ideas of ecology are central to Marx. And if you go right back to his PhD, which looked at physics, you know, you have an utterly materialistic and ecological view, and you can trace this through Marx and Engels. They're concerned with environmental problems like deforestation. Um, there's the wonderful um, quote somewhere in Capital, Volume 3, where Marx talks about the fact that when we think that, um, you know, the, the same way that it's ridiculous to think of human beings owning other human beings as slaves, Marx said quite explicitly one day it will be ridiculous to think of human beings owning the earth and that we just are caretakers of the earth and we have to leave it in a better state for future generations. Now we could have a whole debate about whether better is leaving a park or building a skyscraper, but there is that kind of intergenerational um, ecological kind of politics right at the center of Marx. And, you know, we look at Engels talking about the dialectics of nature, where he says every time we, we think that we've conquered nature, nature takes its revenge. So what we kind of have is a increasingly an eco-socialist politics, which looks to origins in Marx. We have manifestations of this. So where does Ellen Ostrom come in? So the first thing I would say about Ostrom, um, again, is this word pragmatism. Um, that what she and her husband and their network were doing um, was basically starting off with discrete practical problems. They were um, political ecologists, um, her husband Vince, right from the late 1940s. And what they looked at is land management, forestries, fisheries, and looked at how um, social systems, and particularly institutions, interact with the rest of nature. And one of the things which is kind of unusual with them is they've kind of started off with this political ecology, but they're doing this in, you know, Vince from sort of 1945, um, Eleanor, you know, late 50s and 60s. And they're doing this in a period of Cold War um, USA. So, you know, they're not going to Marx. Foucault, I don't know whether Foucault had been born at that point. You know, they're not, they don't fit in with any of them, I'm sure they have been, but you know, they're not fitting in with a lot of the kind of reference points that we know on the left. And what's interesting when you look at Ostrom is what she talks about looks like eco-socialism, but it's mediated through market-based Austrian economists, um, which is very, very unusual. And I think people find very threatening and disturbing, which I think is good. Um, so if we look at a lot of her kind of normative statements, she was elected as um, president of the American Political Society. And when she took her, um, took this, she made a speech. And in the speech, she said, I would like to thank um, the indigenous peoples of North America because they have a seven generation rule. Um, which means that every time we think about policy, we shouldn't think about this generation or our children, our children's children. We should think about the next seven generations, which seems to be a kind of trope of eco-socialism. Um, of course, her work she's best known for is looking at the commons, which is um, collective property, um, resources which are collective, which again we would see as something very much belonging with the left. And you know, there's a whole tradition of looking at commons within Marx. Um, you know, and I could kind of go on, but the theorists that she draws on quite often are people like James Buchanan, who was an economist who inspired public choice, uh, public choice which is associated with Thatcherism, Hayek with his critique of the market. So it's a kind of very odd thing going on. But to emphasize the kind of practical approach they had and the pragmatic approach, that what they would do is, is say you have a resource which is inevitably common. So because it's inevitably common, that then provides a problem. And given that problem, how do people then manage that common pool resource? So um, an example of this would be um, one of their kind of key things, both Vince and Eleanor, is they looked at a um, body of water 
in California, West Basin, my geography isn't so good, I'm probably many geographers here, um, West Basin, which is, um, you know, in Los Angeles, and what you have is um, water, and you have various people drawing the water out. If too many people take the water out, the water level falls, it then draws in seawater, and then that destroys the commons. So you can't privately own the water. You can't have some people owning a little bit of water. It's inevitably common, but unless people cooperate, you have a classic tragedy of the commons. Um, other examples they looked at were, um, you know, Torbel in Switzerland, or she looked at, or basically one of the people's research as case study. And what you have is, um, for people farming, they have winter pasture and summer pasture and have to get from one to the other. And it would be absurd to have people owning little bits of land. And so what they're kind of coming from is you have a particular problem of resource management. You have to come up with institutions to manage that in a way which is ecologically su sustainable. So it's kind of coming at it pragmatically as a problem. So it's not in the sense of institutions saying, um, how does the market work, or we need socialist planning. It's basically saying, we have like a practical, discrete problem of resource management. How do we actually solve that? How do people get enough cooperation to actually make that work? So one of the ways in which I think Ostrom and associated networks are important for eco-socialism is simply in terms of resource management and ecology, and that quite often we might forget the specifics of how human beings interact with the rest of nature in a way which is broadly sustainable. Now, there are various problems with this that we might get onto, but at least there is a you know, materialist, realist focus on actual resources, actual human beings, and management. I think a second way, well, this, of course, perhaps on the first way, this then fits in with the whole critique of the tragedy of the commons, so what kind of really um, got Ostrom writing and what kind of got her producing the governing of the com government, governance of the commons, which is governing the commons, which is her key book, is an encounter with Garrett Harding. So probably most of us are familiar with Garrett Harding, um, who wrote the paper in the tragedy of the commons, 1968 in science, the most cited scientific paper ever. And of course, in that, what he, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, so I'll probably be brief with it, argued, is that if you have property which is common, it will inevitably be destroyed. And that human beings are rational maximizers. Um, you have the past, you have the, um, the grazing land, you have the common, and if too many people put their cattle on it, it will be overgrazed and destroyed. Um, of course, each person who puts cattle on knows that they need to take cattle off. But then if you take your cattle off, other people will put even more on. So there is a basic free rider problem. So this, in kind of formal terms, proves that the commons doesn't work. Um, of course, what's interesting is Harding's wider target was population. And what he was really concerned with is that, um, in his view, overpopulation threatened the earth. What you need is some kind of constraint on population. And basically, the whole intellectual project is to say, we weak, irrational human beings actually need some kind of strong authoritarian rule, or possibly the discipline of the market, because our rationality makes us irrational. So he was very much kind of one of the, you know, Malthusian, Paul Ehrlich, population bomber generation. Now, if you look at Ostrom, um, she was rarely raised to kind of passion and anger, and she was somebody who never kind of polemicized and, and, you know, kind of fought political battles. But the one time when I've kind of seen a trace of, you know, maybe kind of unhappiness or anger from her is this um, very interesting description of when she went to Garrett Harding's meeting at Indiana. So Bloomington, Indiana was the campus where Ostrom worked. Um, Harding came along, talked about the tragedy of the commons, and he talked about population, and he said, um, what I'm saying um, proves that we need to cut population. 
and that once people have had one child, they should be sterilised. Um, so Eleanor got up and said, isn't this a little bit extreme? And he said, no, 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 this is, you know, inevitably will destroy the planet or whatever. So you have to sterilise families if they've had more than one child. So it's this authoritarian, um, totalitarian kind of approach. And then she kind of thought, I've been studying the commons, and Vince has been studying the commons, and there's not always a tragedy of the commons. You know, sometimes commons succeed. So, for example, in West Basin, there's a whole messy um, history. This is the water course, a uh, water table of you know institutions and legal battles, and people say, ah, oh, the Chinatown film was inspired by this, and so on. But basically, that commons wasn't destroyed people did actually come up with ways of managing the water. And she was thinking, well, this is quite dangerous because the tragedy of the commons is being used um, you know, to, to kind of come up with very top-down, very centralist, very authoritarian suggestions. And actually, commons don't always fail. Um, so from that, she was then inspired to kind of research the commons, and what she found was that People have been hydrologists, historians, geographers, sociologists. People across a whole range of disciplines have been studying the whole th the same thing. But it was difficult to, to look at this scientifically because people used different terms. So she was very keen on having a common language. And what she then did was looked at um, case studies. I think some of them may have been Tur in Turkey around irrigation, Torbill. And what she did in governing the commons is looked at um, I think it was seven or eight, maybe more, case study examples of long-term commons. So some of these commons had, had lasted for a thousand years. And with her kind of pragmatic approach, she certainly didn't say commons is the institution, private property doesn't work, the state doesn't work, everything should be in common. Um, but what she did with her pragmatic approach is to say, well, actually, commons, it's a problem, you know, at least Harding is right that it might be difficult to maintain commons. And what she did was to say, well, where do commons work? Where do they fail? So what she did is looked at examples of commons that had failed and collapsed and people couldn't cooperate. She then looked at commons that succeeded and then basically came up with design rules. So what she came up with was eight different um, characteristics of long-term, you know, ecologically sustainable commons. Um, so there would be things like um, boundaries, you need to have some kind of set boundary to it, so controversial because in a sense your commons is enclosed already because you have some kind of boundary. Um, a lot of what she did was around rules and constitutions um, and she would say, you know, you've got to come up with rules to maintain the commons so if the rules are set locally they're more likely to work I wouldn't suggest this meant she was a radical localist. She was aware that you need to kind of aggregate structures. One of the things that was very key in her rules is to say that if people are going to agree rules for rationing use of a resource, the people themselves have to make the rules because if you make the rules and you participate in the construction of the rules, you're more likely to adhere to the rules than if they're imposed from above. Another one of the design principles that seemed to work, and then since then, well, they're not really principles and it isn't design, um, was the idea of graduated sanctions. So um, if you have the grim trigger where if somebody, um, you know, overuses, fishes too much, and you immediately throw them at the commons, that doesn't work. Quite often people um, use too much or whatever simply because they don't understand the rules. So when you have sanctions or punishments, they must start off at a very, very low level, um, not at the highest level. One of the nicest examples of this is somebody uh, is a study of um, Japanese commons where the villagers would um, um, kind of fund a constable, you know, somebody to kind of police the commons, and then if people broke the commons rules, were using the commons in the wrong season, um, they would pay the constable in sake, yeah? So you'd pay in alcohol, yeah? Um, so what she basically did was came up with kind of rules to say this is how the commons might work. But in some ways, even if you talk about rules or principles, that's quite problematic 
because she would say, I mean, I think she was very much an anti-essentialist thinker that I want to get onto, is that in different local contexts, different things will work. These aren't based on eternal principles of human nature or culture, and that these are very, very experimental. And I think one of the, the things which may be difficult when people come to Ostrom's work is what we're quite used to in academia is you have like a position, and then you have another position, and obviously the closer the positions are, the more you fight. And what she kind of tended to do, and her husband tended to do, is like have a starting position, which is how do we deal with a practical problem? There is, you know, there are some kind of normative assumptions, but like with Marx, the normative assumptions are very much in the background. So you have normative assumptions of ecological sustainability, um, you know, of, of radical democracy, of self-governance, of um, you know, intergenerational and so on, but they're very much in the background. It's not that you're kind of arguing for these things as first principles. It's actually saying what's happening pragmatically. So where people would come along and say, actually our research shows that you need a ninth principle or that you've got the emphasis here wrong, she would quite often say, actually I've got it wrong, and then change it. So you know, that you can either see that as great or as, as sort of in retreat from any, any kind of criticism. I'm trying to kind of emphasize the, this idea of pragmatism. So to kind of fit this back into the eco-socialism, obviously to say um, that commons can exist, I think is a second big contribution. Um, so to emphasize again, you know, in many ways you draw on um, economists who we'd, we'd see as free market libertarians and Austrians, she was not a radical opponent of the market. She was not a radical opponent either of the state. But what she did, which I think is revolutionary and essential to eco-socialism, as a second point, is to actually say there isn't just the market, there isn't just the state, that there are a whole kaleidoscope of institutions. There's a whole spectrum of economics. And if we have this kind of binary economics where you either have the market or the state, that doesn't work. I, I quite often say to people, her kind of vision of economics, um, you know, it's like the rest of economists are watching black and white television, and she's in colour. You know, I mean, this is a much more massively sophisticated way of looking at economics than mainstream economics. And again, because it's in colour, because it has a whole series of different dimensions, um, the importance of it may be missed. So absolutely revolutionary that you have somebody with a Nobel Prize lecture in economics which is entitled Beyond Markets and States. Because I think even on the left, it's rare that we think beyond markets and states. So yeah, the, the ecological management, important. The very fact that you've got commons, very, very important. But I think there are other things which are equally important for kind of eco-socialist institutionalism. So a third element is the element of radical democracy and self-government. So what she's basically doing, and again, this is very much with Vince, her husband, as political economists and institutionalists, what they're basically saying is that economics is always based on institutions, that if you look at things like the market, um, that there's particular property forms, and those are institutions, and so on. So in a sense, to kind of say... Um, there's a division between markets and institutions is always <laughs> wrong. You know, the idea of a you know, pure market, you know, as we know from people like Karl Polanyi, is completely false. So what she's saying is any kind of form of economics is with an institutional structure. Um, when we look at politics, that creates institutional structures. But politics typically has been about senates and congress and kings and queens and national government. And in fact, what politics is, more fundamentally, is the way that all of us as human beings build institutions. Um, there are many really nice Eleanor Ostrom stories, but one I, I remember is she was talking about being at an academic politics conference and was reading a book on peasants. And then somebody came and had a go at her and said, that's not politics. You know, senates and congress and presidents, that's politics. And what she would say is that all of us are building institutions to cooperate with other people. So, you know, think of an example if you have students 
sharing a fridge. That involves some politics and institutions and rulemaking and you know, how do you manage your resources and so on. So in some ways it's kind of putting the politics completely upside down. So it's saying you, know, you cannot separate economics or ecological management from politics. It's about constitution building institutions and rules. But fundamentally these rules go right through society. So in some ways it's almost like kind of Foucault talking about micropolitics. Although one of the criticisms of Bostrom is maybe she didn't talk enough about macro politics. So what she's saying is a kind of third thing is that um, you need radical democracy, self-government, and um, all the time we're making institutions and rules. And if you want to deal with practical ecological problems, the way to do this is for people to actually take control and negotiate and agree rules and so on. And if you don't have that kind of radical democracy, you can't deal with ecological problems. So, for example, if you look at climate change, she would say, yes, of course, we need global agreements on climate change. But what you have is, what you need are polycentric systems, different tiers, because you have to look at what happens on the ground. So, again, you can see how, in some ways, that comes from quite an Austrian Hayekian kind of vision, where Hayek would say, there isn't enough knowledge that if you have planners and with ecology, you can't plan ecology on a planetary basis because it's very much looking at local ecologies and what might go wrong and what might go right and so on. This kind of vision of kind of self-governance, I think, comes from a wider, deeper, radical Republican strategy, not Republican in terms of the right-wing party, but in terms of like res publica, from the Latin, from the kind of Roman idea that you have some resources which are held in common, and then we can see how that fits into ideas of Italian city-states and Machiavelli and Spinoza, and then both the Ostroms and Negra and Hart will talk about how that's translated into the American Constitution. So I think that kind of third element of radical democracy, self-government, um, dialogue with people, is also very, very important to eco-socialism. So, you know, okay, we could maybe at a macro level say that there are principles of eco-socialism, but what are the rules and institutions and governance on a local level to kind of make that work? I think another area um, where her work is very, very important is in terms of academic practice. And that what she would say is when we do academic practice, um, we need to kind of challenge the way that academic practice is very elitist. So one of the things which is unusual about the Ostroms is they made their own furniture. And you might not think that's very, very important, but literally they would see academic practice in the same way as carpentry. You know, it's not even a metaphor. So key kind of thing, um, they got their house in Bloomington, which I believe they built. So it's interesting when you have political economists who can actually build their own house. And then they thought, um, we need furniture, so they went to the local carpenter, said, can you build us some furniture? And then the carpenter said, um, oh no, it'd be much better if I taught you how to make your own furniture. I'm not quite sure how this guy made his money, maybe there's a whole <laughs> commons anyway, but you know, it's this wonderful post-commodity vision. And they went along once a week and learned how to make furniture. Um, um, Vince Ostrom would say that when you make constant Constitutions. I know quite often their stuff can look naive and empirical and folksy and so on. Um, you know, when you make a, a constitution, that's a human endeavour in the same way that we would make furniture. That, you know, you have particular qualities of material, you can assemble them in particular ways. And I think that cuts through lots of kind of debates about determinism and agency and so on and so forth. So the idea is that if you look at the self-governance and if you look at academic work, um, yes, it has to be in some sense social scientific, you need to do research, you need to aggregate ideas, um, you need to you know, come up with useful information, but it's basically about people choosing what they do, rather than having something which is imposed from above by elite experts. Um, what comes in with this as well is what she did was very, very collectivist, so it's ironic that you have somebody from in some ways a very liberal tradition, and everything would be very, very collectivist. So when you look at her stuff, 
very, very little of it is single author. Most of it is, you know, two, three, four, five authors. Um, you know, whenever you talk to her, she would say, it's not just down, down to me, it's down to Vince. There's very much work between her and her husband. And then what they have in Bloomington, Indiana, was the workshop. So the idea of the workshop, um, which is their kind of research centre, um, I got told one story that they called it the workshop to confuse the academic authorities, they'd be left alone. But also the argument is that it's literally a workshop in the same way that your intellectual practice is like you're making your carpentry. Um, very, very kind of collectivist. And I think there's at least one or two people in the audience who can say more about the workshop, because I've not been there. I'm just writing histories and probably getting the stories wrong and the, the narratives confused. But one story that, that I liked about her was when she was awarded the Nobel Prize, you have to make the speech. So we know, of course, this is beyond markets and states. And what she did was wrote the draft of this and then took it to the workshop and said to her students, tear this apart, criticize it. So it's very much this kind of academic practice which is trying to be radically democratic, which is very collective, which is individuals interacting in a collective, which is interdisciplinary. Um, you know, I could, I could go on and on. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Am I? OK, because I'm you know, very much Marxist. You know, Latin American left influence. You know, I've, I've heard Chavez speak for three hours. And wish he'd spoken for another five. And you know, I could just go on all day, really. Um, but to start to kind of, and I probably will, to start to kind of wrap wrap this up. And I'd emphasise that's not the tradition she was in. She was much more democratic than us. Um, you know, in terms of eco-socialism, yeah, there's this critique of capitalism, which is destroying the planet. Um, Ostrom is useful for this, actually saying, how do you manage resources ecologically and actually looking at the ecology? Um, she actually says that the commons are not inevitably tragic. She then opens up the idea that there's a whole range of different forms of goods and property and governance. Um, she then has this idea of radical democracy and self-government. And above all, she has this idea of radical academic practice okay so to kind of sum up this bit um you know when people say ostrom was about the commons um you know in some ways i think that's wonderful but in other ways i sigh you know the reason i got interested in her was the commons the commons can be seen as a, a solution to ecological problems in ways that we might explore um but she was about much more than that and she famously said no panaceas she didn't believe the commons was the solution to everything. She didn't believe anything was the solution to everything. Um, you know, she's just trying to kind of make her sensitive to there's a whole kaleidoscope of institutions. Um, and it, as I say, it's this kind of pragmatism is the starting point that you've got people who've got a field, they've got cattle grazing. This is in one, Wisconsin in uh, Wyoming in 1945, <laughs> and Vince Ostrom is trying to study how they maintain this. So it's this pragmatic approach. And then what they would do is come up with ever more um, sophisticated research tools and perspectives to look at how people would manage the commons. And again, you know, I, I can't talk about her methodological contributions, but I think they were very interesting in terms of, you know, that she edited a collection called Beyond Positivism, big critique of, you know, she's again trying to do the kind of thing that you know, people like Althusser and Marx are trying to do, but from a different perspective of saying, how can we be scientific without being positivist? Um, so the pragmatism I would emphasize, and also just to kind of bring it back to Rojava, that what you have in Rojava, in Mindanao, um, people in the Peruvian Amazon, Chiapas and so on is saying, you know, how do we have self-governance? Um, we've taken territory, we've had a revolution, how do we actually use our resources and maintain that? And that was exactly, you know, the thing that the Ostroms were most, in, most interested in. Right, critiques of this. Um, when we read, you know, you can have like a reading of any text, sort of symptomatic reading, um, you know, Althazar um, reading Capital. So when Marx was, was writing Capital, he was reading Adam Smith and the free market economists and looking at the silences and gaps you know, and then that's the kind of basis. So the biggest gap, of course, is enclosure, class conflict, you know, the kind of heavy politics of this, the fact
that the commons is tragic because the commons has been stolen and then what we do is we need a kind of Marxist critique and Marx, you know, Engels famously said the thing that turned Marx into a communist was the theft of the, the laws on the theft of the woods. So what you had in the 1840s um, in Germany was peasants being prosecuted for going into the woods, utilising their customary rights to pick up the fallen woods. And that's kind of one of the key things that radicalised Marx in terms of communism and a break from liberalism. So everywhere the commons has been enclosed, and we see this. So you need a kind of politics, I would say, of class struggle and a Marxist critique, as well as the micro. Um, a second problem, I think, with her kind of work is that... Um, what was I going to say? I don't remember what, it, what my second problem with her thing was. It will come back to me in a, in a minute. Um, well, a, a second but rather, I think, less important problem with her work is some people see it as over-complex. So what I really like is the fact that, you know, it's looking at ecological problems as governance. That brings in politics. Um, you've then got a great discussion of rationality and cooperation and, you know, kind of psychology. Um, all of this, the Ostroms argue, has got to be ecologically sophisticated, so it's got to involve like hydrology and biology and so on. Also, there's a turn to language, so it's basically, though they, they've not, you know, they're not kind of down with Paul Deman and so on, it's saying very similar things that everything we have comes through language and that conditions what we do. So you end up with this, you know, kind of amazing kind of system where you've got what's moving towards quite a sophisticated account of language and how that mediates culture. Um, you've got a lot of discussion of the problems with rationality of economics. Um, you've then got everything has to be ecological. So some people would say, this is just a huge branching tree, that the map becomes as big as the territory. And quite often when there's kind of Ostrom lectures, there's so many different categories and people just kind of run. I mean, I quite like that, but that, that's a critique. Um, third critique, which I think is more fundamentally interesting, is this is very much based on um, methodological individualism. So the Ostroms would say, we are methodological individualists. And where they're coming from that is to say, um, you know, individuals need to be consulted, needs to be democratic. So the kind of politics of that are good. But I think it's theoretically untenable. Because, you know, this liberal idea of the separate, um, you know, human ego, I mean, that's not, that's a superstition, isn't it? Nobody believes that. Um, you know, and I find that immensely problematic in terms of methodology, that, you know, we're not these kind of separate, discrete people um, who have complete free will and agency. And you can then see how that fits in with the first problem in terms of, conflict and struggle so there's maybe a kind of failure to theorize macro structures um, although having said that what's interesting about Ostrom probably if I found the quotes I'd, I'd lose it and then couldn't read it I forget my glasses um, but certainly she said um, well actually I had all this methodological individualism drummed into me um, but this is kind of inadequate because if you look at societies there's a whole series of levels and she was saying, I mean, she wasn't, you know, a sociobiologist, but she was saying, if you look at um, the natural sciences, if you try and understand everything in physics, that doesn't work. There's a whole series of different tiers. So even if you do have discrete human individuals, you then have a whole series of social structures on top of that. So that, but I think that's a kind of area of, you know, if you start off with methodological individualism, I think that's very, very problematic. Right, briefly, where do we kind of go with this? Um, you know, I, I, I think we need to, in some ways, kind of ostromize green politics. That, you know, some of us, as sort of hard-nosed Leninists, have been saying, you know, Greens, you've got to be more left-wing and push the Greens to be more left and have had some successes and some failures and so on. And what I think would be really good is to now say the Ostroms open up a whole series of perspectives that could enrich you know, Green parties and political practice. So again, you know, they're not radically anti-state, um, but they do have, I think, in some ways, a healthy kind of, healthy element of Austrianism of saying the state isn't just a black box. 
you know, that if we don't like the market, we can't just say the state can come in and solve all our problems, that states are made up of humans, they're institutions, they get things wrong. So we need to kind of move beyond a kind of statist form of politics. Again, you know, I think it chimes with a whole wider kind of materialist and realist perspective in kind of green politics of saying, let's be anti-essentialist, let's get away from broad slogans. What are the very specific things we're going to do now? Also, in some ways, I think it might be powerful for kind of making green politics more ecological, because I think sometimes green parties can forget ecology, and the ecology they've got is a folk memory of 70s ecology. Um, You know, so in terms of kind of practical projects, I think that's important. Um, I think it would be really great to kind of be promoting her research. And, you know, I think it would be great if people were running master's courses on what she was doing. And I think there needs to be this kind of, um, you know, the common stuff is so important, but there's so much more to the Ostrom project in terms of radical democracy. Um, You know, with what they were doing, it was something where you haven't got kind of fixed conclusions. You keep on growing and changing. So maybe I should wrap up. Is that good? Um, What I would say is, to me, there are two great theorists of political economy and political ecology. And there are, you know, I'm sure lots of theorists and we all work and in a sense as human beings we're all theorists and that's what Ostrom is saying. But what I really like about both Marx and Ostrom is they're saying, you know, it isn't just markets and states. There's other forms of governance and institutions. And what I like about both Marx and Ostrom is the ecology is central to what they're doing. Um, So I'll maybe stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, holding the mic is not <laughs> very comfortable. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, um, Pat will be here in just a second. Um, are there any points of clarification that you would like to ask just now, um, briefly, before we move on to Pat's talk? OK. Hi there. Um, thanks a lot. That was very. Uh, um, nice, good. <laughs> um, uh, I have a question about this essentialism, um, and I'd like to, because I'm working on her work or their work, and and I find it sometimes pretty difficult to grasp. I'm working at it on it from a sort of a f- more uh, political philosophy or philo- philosophy philo- uh, <laughs> philosophy perspective, I guess you'd call it, and a philosophical perspective. And um, and a lot of these sort of categories from philosophy that we understand of you know essentialism, ontology, freedom, they're lack they're not there, and and I find it very difficult to grasp her. And if you maybe have something to say about that, I mean the normative the one is the essentialism, and the other is or the non essentialistic principles, and then the other is the the normative values, and. Um, yeah, and maybe also in contrast to the essentialism of commons that I sort of find that they are not that they are given, which I would say they're not just given. Yeah. Um, I think it's hopefully I'll make clear. Um, if you can't grasp what she's saying and it doesn't fit in with political philosophy, you understand it very well, um, because what. I don't understand political philosophy, but I think what quite often we're trying to do in political philosophy is to say, here are a set of foundations, and here are a set of enduring principles, and then you find more and more exceptions to them, and it becomes more and more problematic, and you have like an industry, which is good, it employs us. And then the alternative is to say, oh my goodness, postmodernism, anything goes, complete relativism. And what you have, I think, a kind of a pragmatic anti-essentialist approach, um, you know, it's literally, here's a field, um, you know, how are we going to stop it being destroyed? You know, it's literally, you know, and it's like you imagine these people make their own house, do their own furniture. They're not, um, there are some maybe exceptions to this, but they're not generally going... Um, 
what did this political thinker say, what did that political thinker say, and coming up with enduring principles. Although, of course, somebody may come in and correct me, of course, what Vince Ostrom would do in his classes would be to, like, take a classic text, break it down, try and understand from first principles what the person was saying. But what the Ostroms were basically about is, like, a practical problem. Where the anti-essentialism really fell into place for me... Um, was there's a really nice article called The Ten Most Important Books, in itself quite an essentialist title, and there's an obscure Danish journal was asking various academics, what are the ten most important texts? And Ostrom came up with a whole series of texts, and no Hayek in there, certainly no Marx, but, you know, James Buchanan and Schieling, the strategist, and, of course, some Vince Ostrom. And one of the texts was, um, I think, Ernst Mayer, or Meyer, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, A History of Biology, I don't know whether you know this. So this is really great. Ten most important books for Ostrom influenced the most. One was a history of biology. And she got various things from this. So one of the things she was saying that in biology, um, what you have is people come up with theory, other people refute it or add to it, and you have an aggregation of knowledge. Whereas in the human sciences, we don't get that. We mainly just fight. But also what I got from this book, and I don't know if she got it as well, but it, it certainly helped me understand her approach more, is that it was saying in the book the key reason why evolution took such a long time to hold, okay, this is partly because of the Christian religion, but more fundamentally, more essentially, it's from Aristotle. So Aristotle, I don't know much about Aristotle, but he would say, um, you know, things have particular essential characteristics. So if you have a squirrel that has some essence of being a squirrel, it can never be a monkey. So, you know, the idea is if you look at our biological nature, you know, that's something that changes and shifts and so on and isn't essential and unchanging and fixed. Um, and I think that kind of informs a lot of her work that to some extent everything is kind of local, is regional, that you're not going to come up with principles um, which, sit all sit which suit all situations at all times. So what you get from that is a kind of anti-essentialism. And again, though she certainly wasn't a Marxist, we again see this in Marx, that what Marx wasn't trying to do was build up a whole series of essential principles, but to say, if we want a democratic, ecological society, how do we intervene practically? So if you look at both Marx and Ostrom, I would say in a sense they're pragmatic thinkers. I'm sure people will throw bricks at me, and that's fair enough, you know politician I'm used to this um, you know but both of them are not kind of interested in here are some principles for all time it's more you know, how do you kind of intervene so Marx is kind of saying well what's the situation with class forces and society and so on we can't have like a utopian thing where educated people build up a perfect model and then impose it what's actually going on in society and then the Ostroms are saying um, well, what you actually need is a sort of micropolitics and how do people manage institutions? So, you know, I think both, you know, the more liberal kind of followers of Ostrom and Marxists like me, I think would agree very much that it's from pragmatism. And you can see how she was based on liberal thinkers. You can see how she informs eco-socialists. It then becomes very confusing because you think here is a liberal um, who says there isn't just private property, um, you know, who then challenges ideas of rationality. Um, so I think if you try and fix her in terms of principles, that really doesn't work. If you then say, what's a utility? I mean, my friend Kevin Carson, who's a left libertarian, has written a really good paper on Ostrom and anarchism. And I would, could kind of disagree and say she wasn't an anarchist at all, she was a Republican. But that isn't the point. You know, it's how... But if you try and say, how does she fit in with traditions, it, it doesn't fit in neatly. So I've talk, probably talked far too much. All right, so Pat will talk now. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks to Derek for uh, reminding us of the fact that uh, Ostrom's approach isn't confined to the commons, but is much more general in terms of um, self-governance and uh, radical democracy. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different angle on, um, on eco-socialism. Um, 
just perhaps to point out that um, uh, I come at it from really drawing upon, as I think Derek also said in his brief history of uh, the eco-socialist development, uh, what I, I take as being the, the, the best of the socialist tradition uh, and the best of the green tradition. And what I think uh, makes me feel that eco-socialism is the right way to think about things is that the concerns of socialists and the concerns of uh, ecologists, of uh, greens, um, are really both stemming today from capitalism and the way in which it dominates uh, society and non-human nature. Um, uh, and therefore, it seems to me that there is a, uh, a fundamental objective basis for a coming together of the socialist uh, and the green uh, traditions. Um, but what I want to go on to say is that, that, that there's been a lot in the last decades of movements, anti-capitalist um, movements of one sort or another. And uh, at an earlier stage, the slogan was, another world is possible. Um, but what's really uh, done is to go beyond that and, and, and look at, well, what would this other world um, look like? Uh, how might it be organized? Um, and it seems to me that given the experience of the only other world uh, in modern times uh, that we've had, namely the Soviet-style uh, centrally planned system, um, it seems to me important that we address this question. Well, what might another world look like? What might a non-capitalist world look like? And for the most part, what one gets is an expression of the sorts of principles and objectives that such a world uh, would be based upon and try to achieve, but not much about how it might be organized in order to do that, um, let alone how we might get there. Um, so what, that's what I want to, um, to, to focus on, um, looking at it from that point of view. Um, now, although um, Derek pointed out that uh, Eleanor Ostrom and her husband weren't only concerned with the commons. Uh, the commons is the aspect of their work which gets most attention. And the sorts of examples that Derek gave about the commons were, if you like, local, small-scale ways in which uh, people have tried to make arrangements to manage the commons. Um, thinking of the content of yesterday's discussions, um, what I found very interesting there was um, the politics of the possible in the here and now was emphasized. Um, building a life in different communities, groups finding themselves needing to construct lives for themselves after having been displaced. Um, of course, grassroots activities. Um, great emphasis on diversity and the different ways in which people seek to do these things. Um, great emphasis on direct democracy. Um, important emphasis, I thought, on activities which enable people to uh, transform themselves from being objects into being subjects of action. Uh, in which they then empower themselves uh, in order to be able to engage with the world actively rather than be acted upon. Um, and imaginaries rather than models and structures. Now, that's all extremely important, but some people raised questions in the discussions yesterday, and Derek at the end, uh, in his uh, critiques, raised similar questions. Questions that were raised were, okay, so what are the connections between grassroots movements? Um, what are the linkages between them? Um, what relationships do we imagine between autonomous movements on the one hand and uh, higher level social 
uh, movements and structures on the other. Um, what's the relationship between diversity and universal human rights? Um, how do we deal with, with that problem? Um, and then, of course, there's the issue which, again, uh, Derek came back to in, in, in his critiques. W what about the issues of um, uh, class power uh, and how do we deal with that? Now, um, some people in the discussion yesterday, when we come on to uh, social process and institutions, you remember that uh, uh, Gibson Graham presentation was the, the, the different ways in which uh, they had market uh, and then the, the different ways of organizing economic activity. Um, but I want to suggest that we've got to take capitalism seriously. Um, and that although it's very important to point out that there are different modes of production, not everything is a capitalist mode of production. Um, there, there has been this concept of the social formation. Social formation, uh, a historical and geographical structure in which many different modes of production are articulated in different ways, but the characteristics of the social formation are determined by what is the dominant mode of production. And the dominant mode of production today is capitalism. And so somebody asked the question yesterday, well, you know, is household labor, um, is self-employment um, not a separate mode of production from the capitalist mode of production? Well, of course, on the one hand it is, but on the other hand it is shaped by the fact that it fits into the capitalist mode of production. And that is why I find difficulty with some of the um, modern, uh, more recent ways of thinking about uh, processes of resistance. So, for example, um, John Holloway's crack capitalism um, changed the world without taking power. Now, how are you going to change the world, which is dominated by capitalist power and the alliance between capital and capitalist states, without challenging that power? And so what that leads me to is to um, look at the issue of social processes and institutions um, in terms of eco-socialism as being a new social formation different from capitalism, what might it look like? And I think that we have to try and think about the sorts of, I know there's a, there's a, a resistance to generalizations uh, or to models even, um, but still, if one's going to think about how a, a new social system might be constructed, then it does seem to me that we do need to take sort of this between our, our, our teeth and, and look at it and, and have a go at it. So I want to start off then with suggesting some general concepts of key institutions that might um, inform the structure of an eco-socialist uh, society. And I want to start off with social ownership. Now there's been a lot said about the distinction between the market based upon private ownership and the state, uh, as if these were the only two alternatives. Uh, but there are lots of other ways of thinking about uh, ownership. And I want to talk about social ownership as being a general concept, which is neither private ownership nor state ownership, but is rather ownership by the groups of people who are affected by the use of the assets involved. So if you look at the commons, then that would be a form of social ownership at that level. Uh, the commons would be owned by the people who are affected by the use of the assets constituting the commons. And that enables one to think 
uh, of ways of, as it were, generalizing from that concept of the commons uh, owned by its stakeholders or its social owners in my terms. But then what are the social owners at different levels of decision making? What are the social owners, climate change for example, who is affected by uh, climate change? Everybody. Um, so the decisions that are to be made with respect to climate change need to be made, if you think about it in this generalization term, by social owners, which is the global population. Now, how would that work under uh, an eco-socialist society? At the moment, of course, we know the negotiations are between governments which are influenced by the corporations uh, and, of course, by green uh, pressure groups, but largely by the corporations. Um, and they try to do deals and all the rest of it. But supposing we're thinking of a post-capitalist society, how would one organise the, the decisions that were made about climate change? Um, and then there are lots of intermediate levels of decision-making. So it seems to me that that is a general concept that helps us to think about how to extend the fact that we need people who are going to be affected by decisions to take those decisions and to participate in them carry, being carried out because otherwise how are they going to be effectively implemented. Um, so that's the first thing. And that brings me to the question of subsid subsidiarity as I think about it. Um, the question of scale was raised in the discussion yesterday. Um, decisions need to be taken at different scales and most of the discussion yesterday and most of the discussion about the commons is discussion about the most local scale which in a sense is not surprising a because that's the level at which most of us act and b in a way funnily enough it's easier to think about what one might do at the local scale than it is about the global scale or about even the continental scale or even a regional scale so most of the attention is focused on that, not upon these higher level or more general scales. And that seems to me to be a problem, because what that means is that we are doing what we can within the confines of the overall capitalist structure, but we are not finding ways of challenging that structure directly. Unless you think, as I don't, but some people do, that by moving doing more and more uh, activities of this micro character, one will somehow, uh, by osmosis as it were, suddenly displace capitalism and its, its uh, structures of power. And I think that that is something that is, uh, I see as, as a danger in, in, um, in the present situation. Then, if you've got social ownership at the appropriate level, the appropriate scale, then decisions would be made through a process of negotiation, of discussion, of uh, deliberative dem democratic procedures, uh, procedural rationality, mm -hmm. all concepts that ecological economics has developed as ways of dealing with problems which don't have a straightforward scientific uh, resolution, but which involve people and therefore people have to be involved in making the decisions. Um, and that then would enable one to envisage a structure where one has participatory decision making, which of course means at higher scales levels can't just be direct democracy, whereas most of the emphasis at the local level is on direct democracy. But you have to have some combination of direct and representative democracy if you're going to be able to make decisions at these higher levels, these different scales. Um, now, I think that a participatory concept of democracy, direct and representative democracy, uh, involving negotiation between the social owners at the different levels, um, has a, a transformatory uh, aspect. It enables us to move towards the situation which the, the Ostroms, in some sense, uh, symbolized I ideally. So, okay, so you, could, you can have the time to to do the studies they did to write the books and also to learn um, carpentry, um, a bit like Marx and, you know, uh, hunting in the morning and 
uh, fishing in the afternoon and uh, intellectual discussion in the evening. Uh, but in order to do that, what we have to do is to completely change the structure of work, uh, the, la the structure of labour, the, the distribution of time within society, uh, and also change the character of work. Um, but also, we have to recognise that um, we are all shaped by our experiences. And if our experiences are of a particular type of work, and we don't have experience of other forms of practical activity, then we don't know how they work. And so that is the basis for the social division of labour in our society, where certainly in most societies the educational system is structured so that um, people are trained to do particular sorts of work, not to become all-round human beings. And that, I think, is something, again, which is very important for us to, um, to deal with. Now, the last thing I then want to uh, just mention is this issue of, um, of transition. Um, I think that the politics of the possible, building a life, is in a, can be thought of within sort of a political theory framework as building civil society, building the self-governing, self-activating institutions uh, of civil society, which people do uh, in a variety of different ways. And unless we have that active participation at the level of civil society, it's not going to be possible, I think, for us to have a genuinely participatory structure of different <laughs> layered decision-making at different scales. Um, so we need to think about how activities at the local level can be framed in Gramscian terms, articulated in a way which enables them to engage with decisions at higher levels and in particular in the political sphere come together to create a political movement which actually challenges capitalism and seeks in various ways to transcend it, not by uh, activity within the niches that exist, though that is important, but by coming together in various political movements. I'm struck, for example, I mean, I know it's a rather um, problematic issue and I haven't kept up to date with what's been going on in the last two or three years, but I'm struck by the fact that uh, Syriza in Greece, a coalition of of 19, I think it was, different groups and political parties and so on, comes together, makes a political challenge through the electoral system. And what do we see going on? We see, for the first time, a serious challenge to austerity by a government which is in power and which is being hammered by the uh, troika, by the institutions. Uh, it doesn't come out of nowhere, it comes out of the struggles that have been going on in that society for the last 20 years, exacerbated by the crisis. Uh, and we've got to find ways of thinking about things like that, so that challenges can be made to the dominant political and economic structures within which we all act and are shaped. And that seems to me to be the sort of way in which we can think of moving towards an eco-socialist society which at the different levels, the different scales, is able to realise the values of ecological sustainability, resource conservation, the seven nations, uh, the seven generations, uh, but also social justice, uh, equality uh, within countries and between countries, and all that is something that can't just be done by activity which is confined to local levels. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, so we have lots of, um, I think, points to be discussed um, uh, and questions. So uh, we will probably have the coffee break first, or do we want to? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I think it's going to be better as well. Okay, so ten, so ten minutes. Let's say next week at twelve. Let me start twelve. Okay, fifteen minutes coffee break.